welcome. <laughs> cool. So let's move on to the first talk, improving support for deep learning in Essie's ML platform. For avid followers of either my social or the Etsy Code is Craft uh, blog, this is a post recently written by myself and my coworker, Sally Wallica, on the changes that we made in the ML platform team, which is the team that I'm on at Etsy, um, in order to support deep learning more at scale. Um, for some context, the machine learning platform team is composed of two squads, the ML model training squad, which focuses on infrastructure for training and prototyping, and the model serving squad, which focuses on the infrastructure for serving models at scale and all of the services that enable ML practitioners at Etsy to do it easily and quickly. So this is an absolutely terrible uh, graph that I made really, really quick in Matplotlib. But um, the whole thing here, if you can even read it, is that in Q1 of 2021, we had two models using TensorFlow serving. Um, Ala, our, one of our speakers today, will be talking about those a little bit later. Um, now we have almost 70 models in our production environment in our Kubernetes cluster using TensorFlow serving. Um, almost all active development is done using deep learning libraries um, and deployed. So this is throwing a host of new challenges at us when it comes to scaling these models and managing these things in, um, in production. As more teams launch more deep learning models at scale, um, the real-time workloads are becoming more challenging to troubleshoot and issues are becoming more challenging to remediate. So we have custom feature transformations using things like TensorFlow Transform, where ML practitioners can write their own code, package it with a model and serve it. If it's not written well, we can see huge spikes in latency. I think we published a previous post where Something like a double for loop, removing one of those uh, took the P99 latency from like 400 milliseconds down to like 10 milliseconds or something like that. Um, so we've had feature transforms be hugely costly in these workloads. Um, deep learning models have different ideal infrastructure settings from some of our previous models. So TensorFlow has some guidance themselves for TensorFlow serving on the infrastructure settings of serving these things in production. Um, but we kind of need to figure out what works best for us, where we find that sweet spot between cost and latency, since we have to be very fast when we serve these models. Um, and finally, one of the most important things is that previously when we were serving smaller classical models, these things were tested right before going into production. We didn't have an early feedback loop on latency of models because we didn't need it. We could say like train a gradient boosted tree model, throw it into production and be confident yeah, as long as, you know, it works, it's not going to be costly and it's probably going to net a profit. It's not always the case with some of these new frameworks. And we need to develop new processes and new tooling around that so that we could figure that out as early as possible um, and remediate it before getting to the stage where we would delay a production experiment. So this graph or this uh, picture put together by the lovely Sally Wallica is just meant to show uh, kind of the scale of what we're doing, right? So when you type in a search on Etsy, um, you'll get like a thousand candidates of different listings from Etsy's whole catalog of millions and millions of listings per search. For each one of those listings, we're gonna go to our feature store and fetch roughly 300 features. So, you know, we're already at a thousand times 300. Um, and then we're gonna send those over in batches of five to 25 to our TensorFlow model for scoring to be returned to you um, on like, you know, 50 results per page or whatever. So these payloads um, previously for gradient boosted tree models, like a single prediction is like four megabytes. So the scale of doing these things um, for all of our search ranking use cases was super, super massive. And even in our new infrastructure with like gRPC and protobufs, talk about that later, um, it's, it's still quite large. So we had a lot of issues launching these new models, as you can imagine, at that scale with deep learning. We had additional model latency with uh, those custom transform features. We had different infrastructure settings, like I mentioned before. Um, so this is just showing a uh, little Kubernetes thing. You probably can't see it, but we had to tune things like CPU requests and CPU limits since we had bursty models. Um, we ran into things like CPU throttling, a lot of really lower level infrastructure concerns that we hadn't previously run into with traditional models. And finally, late feedback loops. So this image that you definitely can't see is just showing that basically an ML practitioner would get all the way to launching a model, 
before they would figure out, oh, I can't launch this suddenly experiment delayed by weeks because we have to get together and rush to troubleshoot latency before figuring out that launch. So the first thing we did is create a tool called Caliper, which is a fun, you know, that measure thing. That's honestly the best way that I can think to describe it right now. Um, it's the measure thing. Um, and the whole idea is that it's like a nice prepackaged solution for our uh, TensorFlow models and hopefully future models um, for getting early latency feedback. Um, essentially, any ML practitioner can take a trained model and either through a UI that's currently under construction or a CLI, um, they can take their historical data, their training data, uh, and hit a model right in production and then get a full readout of their latency performance, the cost expected to serve that model for the amount of time we ran the load test for, um, along with some other things. So for this, we use KubeCost, which is a Kubernetes cost tool. We use uh, TensorBoard. Um, we automatically pull stuff out of TensorBoard. And then we uh, write the results ourselves um, to a viewable HTML. So here is a demo. Let's see if this is viewable. Yeah. All right. So hopefully you can see some of this. But um, basically what this is doing is just taking a Docker command and a bunch of arguments specifying the parameters of a small load test. And what we're doing is saying we want to load test this TensorFlow model using this protobuf payload for 10 seconds. And I want to get all the results. I want to get the latency. I want to get the cost. Um, and I want it to be easily consumable for me as an ML practitioner. Um, all I need to provide is like the model name that I'm putting in production and some like serialized payload from my training data, which you can easily pull out of uh, TensorFlow things like TF records and hit it. So this, uh, this load test is now running. It uses GHZ under the hood, which is a nice tool for gRPC load testing. And then down here, which you might not be able to see behind the recording thing, you're gonna see that this cost a fraction of a cent to run for 10 seconds against this model. So that's pretty good. We could always run it for longer. And we have this HTML completely viewable. So this is going to pull up um, the complete readout of load testing results for this model in addition to the cost. So you can see the latency distribution, we can see the amount of errors that we had in addition to um, like the error breakdown. And we can, of course, see the cost and then export this data for further analysis. Now, what's exciting about this, of course, is not only the fact that we are load testing, everyone is, um, but that we can, of course, build more intelligent things on top of this in the future um, and continue to like make this process more automated for ML practitioners and make it happen as early as possible in the process. Back to this tab, cool. So that was one thing we did. That refers to the machine learning process part of it. The next thing that we did back in the slideshow mode, so now you know what's gonna happen. Um, honestly, half of the like issue here was just finding the problem. And a distributed system, like observability is literally everything. If you're working with like Kubernetes and gRPC and all that kind of stuff, if you don't have observability, you're not even going to know where to start when it comes to troubleshooting latency in these payloads. So we were trying to look, you know, when we initially had high latency for deep learning models, was it our feature store? Was it our, I definitely did these in the wrong way. Um, yeah, there we go. Was it uh, like, was it the gRPC request to our ILB? Was it, you know, like essentially first byte to last byte reaching our load balancer? Or was it our proxy within the cluster? Or was it the Kubernetes service, which is basically just a DNS lookup? Or was it somewhere in the TensorFlow serving pod itself? And if so, was it deserializing the payload? Was it the prediction? All of these things were things that we had no visibility into whatsoever and had to troubleshoot by kind of just like removing one piece at a time and, and hitting it. So what we did was invest further in observability. We added distributed tracing to our systems for more system-wide observability so you could get spans and see how long um, different portions uh, of our system were contributing to latency. We got new metrics from proxies like Envoy and made new dashboards with them that helped out. And we added new ways to test latency like Caliber, um, which allowed us to iterate faster and find the problem faster. So 
even with all of that, we were still kind of confused. We saw high latency, even with small protobuf payloads. So over here on the left, we have uh, the network request size for gradient boosted trees in our old models. This is REST with JSON. So this is just serialized JSON payloads, classic REST. On the right, we have the request size with our deep learning models, which now use uh, protobuf, like binary payloads with gRPC. Um, binary ones, one megabyte, these spike up to, you know, almost eight megabytes at times. But still, we saw higher tail latencies, specifically, um, like our P99 latency was still much higher for deep learning models. Using our observability, we saw that it was actually first byte to last byte transmitted from our orchestration system to our serving layer. So we worked with our amazing um, partners within search, uh, within ML enablement as well, the search orchestration team, to reduce payload size by 25% using payload compression with gRPC. Um, so this resulted in a PNET 99 latency drop of roughly 50 milliseconds. And as you can see here, the payloads are down to like 250 kilobytes or something like that. Um, so a dramatic reduction in payload size, dramatic improvement in latency, um, and the cost, of course, to serve these models, which is great. In summary, test latency and cost early because you're going to have to troubleshoot it with deep learning. And observability is literally everything in production, even with ML. Um, I can't stress enough how much, like, how important it is to be able to identify problems before solving them. Um, but yeah, I imagine I'm already over time. Special thanks to everyone who contributed in this work. And would love to open it up for questions if we have time for that. Thank you very much.